13. Good morning, McIver family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to see all of your faces. It um, was not the way we hoped to have our Good Friday service, obviously. But again, we're grateful for technology that allows us to gather um, in a creative way. So I just want to welcome you all to our Good Friday service. Um, we had to change it a little bit, of course, uh, to fit this format. But just want to remind everyone that we all get the best sound if everyone is muted. So unless you are speaking, and you'll know if you have a role this morning, please mute yourself. Um, we Otherwise, we hear all the background noise that's going on in your space. There. So there's a mute button. It, it varies whether you're on a laptop or a phone. And of course, your phone, whether it's Android or iPhone, it's all a little different, but you should have a little microphone with the word mute somewhere. And if you click on that, a little red line will go through it and you'll know that you're muted. So almost all of you are muted, but if you can find that little button, that would be awesome. A little later on, um, we're gonna be led through communion at the end of the service. So you may wanna get some elements ready if you haven't already done that. But I think we're ready to, to begin. So just wanna share a few um, thoughts and a prayer before we head into our service. Come here. So Good Friday is a day when we consider the cross, when we consider the crucifixion of Jesus, his death and what that cross means to us. A theologian N.T. Wright, some of you may be familiar with him, when considering the cross, calls it a strange, powerful mix of recognition and horror. A strange, powerful mix of recognition and horror. And horror, horror, horror. We are invited to gaze at the cross, to consider its implications, and we can bring ourselves to the cross. We can bring our hopes and our dreams, but also our struggles, our failures, and our losses. Ironically, all of life is fulfilled at the cross. It's the place where God in the person of Jesus takes it all upon himself. Yeah. We can bring the hopes and prayers and sorrows of our lives and also of the world to the cross for it's the place where death and new life meet. Let's open with a prayer. And this prayer comes from N.T. Wright. Almighty Father, Look with mercy on this, your family, yeah, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon a cross. Who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
While Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. And the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. They led Jesus to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. Finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest said to Jesus, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. You have said it. And in the future, you will see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy. Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him jeering, prophesy to us, you Messiah, who hit you that time. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? You have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, Hmm. Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. The leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who was called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. 
The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip and turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Looks like Brian. So he, so he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait. Let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of men, many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This gift of the Son of God is indescribable because we cannot completely wrap our minds around it. Our concepts, theories, formulas fail to completely capture all that is going on in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yet, we are invited into it. This year, we've been invited into the story through Matthew's perspective. We have walked the journey of this gospel throughout the season of Lent, 
and come to this culmination in chapter 27, what we just heard read for us. But did you catch that last part? I want us to hear verses 50 to 53 again. And if you can, if you don't already, I encourage you to get these verses in front of you. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 53. They read, then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. But now this, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. So that's different. I can't say I've ever heard a sermon or devotional on these verses. I can't say I would have included these verses if I were in charge of writing or editing the Bible. But there they are, a key feature in Matthew's Good Friday, what some have referred to as Easter zombies. These verses raise all kinds of questions and pose all kinds of problems to our theological systems. And in this brief Zoom time today, I am not attempting to answer all the questions or solve all the problems, but I felt it was important that this story was included and that we consider what it might mean for our lives. I think it means at least the following three things. One, <clears throat> in the death of Jesus, there is life. In the death of Jesus, there is life life. I realize that this section pokes holes in our airtight theological boxes, but it would seem, at least according to Matthew, that on Good Friday, resurrection is already beginning to happen. On Good Friday, resurrection is already beginning to happen. See, the full life of God was in Jesus. The breath that had blown in the beginning, all creation into existence, rattled through failing lungs on the cross that day. Struggling, gasping, holding on until the very last breath. And with that final breath, Jesus cried out, and released his spirit. And look what happens as this life pours out of Jesus upon creation. The curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split apart. Tombs opened. And the bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. When Jesus died on the cross, the full life of God broke out upon creation, beginning to undo death. In the death of Jesus, there is life. Two, this life in the death of Jesus is both now and not yet. Notice these key words in verse 51. At that moment. Something happened in that very moment when Jesus released his last breath. Something that was a cataclysmic change. Triggering the shift from death to life. And ushering in a new era. At that moment. The dead have new life. At that moment, 
the world is fundamentally altered. At that moment, nothing will ever be like it once was. And then, waiting. Look at verse 53. These people have been raised from the dead, the first to walk in this era of a new world through Christ. And what do they then get to do? Wait. They stay. They remain. They wait until after Jesus' resurrection. There's a major theological point here, one that Paul presents in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ would be the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Jesus is the first of a great harvest of resurrection. Denver, you are muted. Okay, I guess I got muted. Um, what was the last thing people heard? Just go back two sentences. Okay. <clears throat> In verse 51, uh, there's this key phrase, at that moment. At that moment, the dead have new life. At that moment, the world is fundamentally altered. At that moment, nothing will ever be like it once was. And then, waiting. We look at verse 53. These people have been raised from the dead, the first to walk in this era of a new world through Christ. And then what do they get to do? Wait. They stay. They remain. They wait until after Jesus' resurrection. There is a major theological point here, one that Paul presents in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ would be the first of a great harvest of all who have died. But this is also an accurate description of the new life that comes through Christ and how we ourselves experience it. It is in some ways sudden and others slow. At points, it feels like rising up and at others like resting. It is now and it is not yet at the same time, but all of it points to Jesus. And the third thing I think we can take away from this passage is that this life that is in death is in us. According to Matthew, there was more than one stone that rolled away on Easter. There were a great many gravestones that no longer applied. The life in the death of Jesus began to take up residence in those who were dead, raising them up into life. This was actually some of the first witness to the power of Christ's death, that it showed up in the animation of people's bodies. Not in concepts or theories or even stories, but in real flesh and blood that put this new life on display. On Good Friday, we don't have it all figured out just yet. Life and death are active simultaneously. Passion and patience are interwoven. Blizzards and blossoms are happening at the same time. All of this mixed existence is constantly going on within us. This is what our lives are like. And God has given the life of his son to meet us in the midst of our mixed up, messy experience. But even more so, 
so that we would be found within the life of Christ. Paul would go on to describe Jesus as the one who holds all creation together, who reconciled everything to himself and made peace with everything in heaven and on earth through his blood on the cross. Today, we are reminded and we receive this promise that the life that is in the death of Christ has entered our lives, defeating the power of death. Through Christ's death, the world has been fundamentally altered, a new era ushered in, and today we are invited to life in that reality. In a few moments, we will share this life together at the Lord's Supper. And if you haven't already gathered your elements of bread and juice or something similar, I encourage you to get those ready. But now we have some readings and prayers from this passage of Colossians chapter 1 that speak to the gift of life that comes to us through Christ. Let's receive this gift. Prayer of awe for who God is and his power in the world. Colossians 1, 15, 17. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Lord, you created us because you wanted us, and that makes you responsible for our life. You created us for your own pleasure to enjoy us, your creation. When I myself create something, for example, a painting, I do create it for my own pleasure. I make it so I can enjoy it. I want to keep it and take care of it. I don't let anything happen to it unless it's for its own good. I retouch it and finish it. I certainly don't let anybody destroy my painting. It's exactly what you do with our lives, Lord. You created everything. Everything we don't see like gentleness, honesty, and other good things. You also created things that in our own eyes are not so enjoyable, but you created them for a purpose. You created them because when we are in despair, this is when we see you the most. We see how you provide, how you love us, how you take care of us in an unimaginable way. You are above everything and above all. You know our name and we belong to you. You are worthy of all praises. Amen. My prayer is based on Colossians 1 verse 18, uh, the first part, uh, the theme of loss of loved ones and of eternal hope. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Our Heavenly Father, today as we walk, I pray that we would live in awareness that God made the greatest sacrifice in reconciling us to him through the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. We prepare to receive your love, which flows eternally from the cross. Jesus your resurrection proves your lordship over the material world. All who trust in you and have trusted in you will also defeat death and rise again to live eternally with him. Because Christ is spiritually supreme, first in everything in the universe, I pray that we would give him first place in our thoughts and activities. With grateful hearts, we know and believe that because of the resurrection, that death has been conquered. Your resurrection helps us find meaning even in great loss. No matter what happens to us as we walk with the Lord, 
We thank you that the res resurrection gives us hope for the future. Our wow. sins, sorrows, and failures of the past are cru crucified with Christ, dead and buried. What a glorious truth that in Christ alone our hope is found, and by his death and resurrection we have assurance. We have hope that we too will be raised from the dead. The resurrection brings new hope. It brings a new order of things that is only possible after death. Jesus began it, and one by one, as his people, we will follow Jesus and enter into his glorious presence. Thank you that as a part of his body, the church, by grace through faith in him, we have been inputted with his righteousness and made a new creation in Christ. Thank you that I am, we are, a member of his body, and that through his resurrection, we too will be raised with all the ones that have gone before us. Amen. I will be reading Colossians 1, verses uh, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence today. Um, your power is not limited to the physical spaces we find ourselves in. You are at work all throughout the world and we praise you for this. Thank you for your word where we get to read about the sacrifice uh, that your son has made for humanity. As these verses say, your fullness dwells within Christ. He has and will always be part of you, and for that we are grateful. Through Christ's death, all people are provided a way to come to you. We can take these verses and know that there is peace in the anguish and discomfort of Jesus' sacrifice. We read about how our sinfulness deserves the death that Jesus died, but he took our place, allowing us to be with you forever. Thank you that we can come to you, that we are reconciled to you on earth and in heaven. As we go through these next few days, I pray for a quiet heart, that we will read of Jesus' story and be in awe of what he's done for us. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. Amen. So now as we hear this last part of Colossians 1, <clears throat> And we reflect on this amazing gift of our lives, our life being brought in Christ. I want to encourage you to look on your screen at your brothers and sisters. We're actually afforded uh, maybe a helpful perspective today on Zoom uh, of this, this perspective of our lives in Christ together. Colossians 1.21 this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault this is what god has done for us to us in the death of his son jesus so now we live in that reality we receive that gift of god that defines our lives as we listen to this next song, let us reflect on and let us receive this life as we take these elements of bread and juice and receive God's grace through the death of his son, Jesus.
And do we have that song? Uh, gonna turn it over to Michaela. Okay, wow. Well, uh, thank you everyone for being um, a part of today's service. We really appreciate the flexibility that you um, have shown in this quite interesting time. Um, and we're also excited to gather together on Sunday uh, to celebrate Easter and getting to flower the cross. It will be a really exciting day. So we hope that you will join us. Uh, in closing today, I wanna finish off Matthew 27 verses 55 to 61. And it reads, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So this is where we finish the story for now. Um, and as you can see, it is unfinished. Imagine the followers of Christ in this time who were living in this moment, you know, unsure of what was to come for them, deeply saddened by the death of their leader. I encourage you to allow this somber moment to sink in, um, to not rush into the excitement of Jesus' resurrection, but to sit and live in this state. There is faithfulness in sitting and watching, in remaining still and experiencing the difficulties that come with Jesus' death. There is a time to pause and wait for Sunday, to think about how this might have been for the disciples and the wider faith community. So I hope that you can remain with God in this time and feel blessed as we go through these days of darkness, kind of understanding their importance in the larger story of Jesus and the church. So go in peace and blessing throughout the rest of your weekend. Bye, everyone.